everybody. Cindy and I made it to Katrina and Simon's house, so we're in the woods with our grandkids, enjoying this part of our vacation. So keep praying for us. But we're praying for you, and today we've got James Grissel, the James Grissel from Calvary Chapel, Galveston, coming home to Amarillo to bless us. So would you welcome James? We love you guys. We'll see you soon. Hey, what's up? I can't see any of you. Um, there we go. Lights coming up. First service, I walked out before that video even started playing, and I was like, I think I messed this up, but I don't know. I don't know how these things work anymore. Um, so, yeah, Bill, Bill got it right. If you don't know who I am, um, James Grizzle, nobody's special, but I, uh, this was my church forever. And five years ago, I moved down to Galveston to start a church, and my family and I, and that's where we've been. We've been on an island, uh, literally, and uh, doing church down there, and trying to enjoy 2020 as best as we can. I don't even know. Um, hoping for it to go away soon. Uh, maybe 2021 is going to be a better year. But today, I'm here with you guys. So yeah, you don't have to clap. It's cool. <laughs> um, this is so weird. It's just so spread out. Um, that makes my job, uh, you shouldn't sit by each other. I mean, it, I, I understand the social distancing thing, but as a speaker, I have to do a lot of this now. So uh, that's kind of cool, but um, I might miss some of you guys, but that's all right. So um, yeah, uh, you guys doing all right? You doing good? Sweet. Um, uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I get to share with you guys. I get to lead you guys in communion, which is a, I, I count it as a privilege. I, it's a, definitely a privilege to stand here uh, in this pulpit and on this stage and get to share with you guys the word of God, um, especially considering uh, you guys got Bill, like he was my hero. So you guys get him and you guys let him go away on a vacation. So that's kind of nice of you too. That's cool. Um, but I, I'm glad I get to show up and, and share with you guys what the Lord's doing. So um, so you can see on the screen, that's not me. That'll never be me. Um, that's, uh, that wave is too big. Uh, I do surf, but not like that. That guy's crazy. Um, more importantly is no worries. No worries. So what we're going to talk about today is this element of worry, fear, anxiety. Anybody know anything about that? Anybody been dealing with that lately? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, uh, listen, this is something that I shared with our church down there in Galveston uh, at the beginning of this whole COVID thing, not even knowing what this thing was. Um, but we could see this wave of fear that was going to be like smashing over everybody. Um, and so the Lord put it on my heart to share this message there. And then as I was praying and getting ready, actually preparing a whole nother message for you guys, the Lord's like, no, they need to hear this one. So if you could turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm going to read from the text, and then I will pray, and we'll get, we'll get started. I'm going, to start in, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start in verse 1 of chapter 5. Now, I'm not going to teach through all of this. Just so you know, I'm primarily going to focus in on uh, two verses. But I, uh, just for the sake of context, I want you guys to understand where we're, where we're coming from. So 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse 1, <clears throat> it says this. The elders who are among you, I exhort, and the elders would be like the, the leadership of the church, um, who I am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker uh, of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, um, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, that's kind of in reference to that Psalm 23, Jesus is the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, okay? When he appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So just a heads up, in case you guys don't know this or you haven't experienced this or realized this yet, um, the leadership team here at Grace, uh, they, they love you guys. Okay, and like they're doing these things in the sense of they're serving you. I, I hope you you know that. If you're not, if you don't know that, you're new here. You're like maybe considering is, if this is a church for you. I can tell you um, because I used to work here um, that this staff here absolutely loves you guys, and they're doing their best to shepherd the flock. Okay, so 
I just want to, I, I want to throw that out there as we're just kind of walking through this. This is Peter communicating to the body saying, look, um, this is how churches should be ran, right? You got leadership. Let's, you know, let's let the leadership be good leadership, invest in the flock and all that good stuff. So we're moving down this list. Likewise, verse five, you younger people. Um, well, there's always probably somebody older than you, so this applies to everybody, right? So that's, that's the uh, silver lining in this verse, okay? It applies to all of us. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all you be submissive to one another. That's all of us, to each other, okay? And be clothed with humility. Now, here's where we get into the key of this, the verses I'm gonna go through, this, this aspect of humility. Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, verse six, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares, all your worries, all your anxieties, all of your fear onto him or upon him, for he cares about you. Or you could say it like this, because he cares about you, all right? So I'm going to pray, and we're going to just jump right into this, and we're going to look at this man who the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit used to, uh, to pin this letter, and that, that's Peter. Uh, we're going to look at this guy's life, and how, how in the world can he write this? He's the perfect one to write this verse through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you so much that um, regardless of what we may feel, Lord, you're in control. You're in control. And you got it. And Lord, I know, I know things are, are chaotic within our world right now. Um, truth seems like it's hard to find. But we know your word is true and you are truth. And Lord, so I pray that we are keeping our eyes fixed on you. And during this time of difficulty, Lord, I pray that we as believers, we as Christians, do not forget that we are on a mission. And that mission is to share your gospel, Jesus. And so I pray that you would give us the boldness we need to share your gospel with whoever it is that you want us to share it with, but also, Lord, to know that we can cast all of our fears, all of our cares, all of our anxieties or worries, we can give all of those things to you because you care about us. And that may be the sweetest message somebody needs to hear this morning, Lord, is the fact that God actually cares about you. So thank you for caring about us. Thank you that you cared so much for us that you would send your one and only son to die on the cross for us. Thank you that you love us, Jesus. And we ask that you would be here today, that you would speak to our hearts as we, as we just open up your word. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So Peter, like seriously, why, we, why, why this verse? Why would, you, why would you even throw this out there? Don't you understand how difficult it is? I mean, he doesn't know where we're at. He doesn't know 2020. He doesn't know COVID-19 or corona, whatever you want to call it. He doesn't understand these things. How dare he say, cast all your cares on the Lord because the Lord cares about you? Let me explain to you where he's coming from. At this moment in time, when Peter is being used by the Lord to write this letter, it is costing Christians their lives literally to be followers of Jesus. He's watching people that he loves and that he cares about being dragged out and murdered because they follow Jesus. He's living in a, in a time where to gather like this could very well cost you your life. So it's in the midst of that. It's in the midst of that storm, okay? We are walking through a storm of our own, and yes, it is a storm. I won't downplay it. Okay, I don't know how serious or, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, I don't know anything, okay? I don't know much of anything, but I do know it is a storm. I'm smart enough to know that, okay? Peter's walking through his own storm, and he's watching persecution of a tremendous level happening against the church, and he comes out, and one of his, I mean, he doesn't have much time left on this planet when he writes this letter. Yes, there is a second Peter, right? You can see that in your own Bibles. He is at the end of his life. And he's going to tell the body, he's going to tell Christians, he's going he's to tell them this, listen, you stay focused on Jesus. 
If you're going to gather together, if you can gather together and do church, there's a way in which it should be done. You should have good leadership, but you should also be good churchgoers as well, being humble, considering others as more important than yourself. That's a good word for today, right, in which we live in, considering other people. It's not hard. This is how we do church, but he's also letting them know, but listen, with all those worries you have, with all that fear that you have, and they were carrying around huge burdens of fear. He says, with all that fear, with all that worry, with all that care and the concern, there is a place where you can give it. There's a place where you can take it. And his name is Jesus. And he gladly welcomes your fear. That thing that you're embarrassed about, because you're worrying about this thing and it just, you're constantly worrying about this thing and you can never tell anybody. Because why? Because it makes you look like, what, a lesser Christian? Jesus is saying, hey, give it to me. Just, just give it to me. So Peter is the perfect guy to write this verse. He is the absolute perfect person to write this verse. Paul would write verses that are basically saying the exact same thing. Be anxious for nothing. But what? But through prayer and supplications, make your requests known to God. You got worries? You got anxieties? Let me tell you something that you shouldn't be being told for the first time in your Christian life. People have worries. Christians have anxiety. Christians deal with worry. Christians deal with anxiety. You do. Now, some may deal with it to a greater degree than others. Again, I'm not a doctor. Some of it could be chemical, right? That was really, that was a big boom, huh? Um, gotcha, if you're falling asleep on me, I'll just keep spitting into the mic. Um, it may be a chemical that, and praise God for smart people, scientists, doctors who know how to address some of that stuff. But I would venture out to say that a lot of Christians are dealing with worry and, and anxiety, and you're just kind of trying to do it all on your own. And you're handicapping yourself. I can speak from personal experience. I know what it's like. I deal with anxiety. I wrestle with anxiety. I wrestle with fear. I, I do. I absolutely do. If you're thinking that I got it all put together, I do not. My wife's not here right now, but she's watching on camera. There's like three of them. Hey, uh, hey everybody else watching online. Um, she could tell you right away that I don't have it all together. Man, I go through seasons where those giant waves are crashing down on me. They're crashing down on me too. So then what's the point of this? Is it, is it just easy? Is it, is it just like that thing? Just cast all your cares on them because it cares about you, and then that's it, and move on, and you're done, and you never worry anymore or anything like that. No, that's not how it works. And that's not even the point. That's not even the point of the verse. We'll, we'll, we'll walk through this verse uh, again. I, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Mark chapter 4, if you don't mind. Mark chapter 4. This is, this is a perfect example of uh, why I believe Peter is, is the right guy to, uh, to send this message. Mark chapter 4, the gospel of Mark. You got Matthew, then Mark, okay? So you got Peter. He's a fisherman, right? You guys know that? Okay, he grew up on the lake, right? Lake life, right? Lakefront bargain hunt. You guys watch that show? You like that? I watch it. Why? Because I want a lake house because I just need to get away, all right? And I don't know about you guys, but I'm like, can I just like live by a lake? I already live by the water. It's called the Gulf of Mexico. But sometimes we get really big storms that um, tear everything down in our town. So I would like a peaceful experience of the water for once. But um, here's Peter grew up on the lake. He's a fisherman. He's been on a boat probably his whole entire life. He's got it figured out, right? Surely this guy has it figured out. Surely this guy doesn't worry about storms. Certainly this guy never has the fear of drowning, right? Oh no, he does. Well, why? Because he's normal, just like you and me. He's normal. Look at this story, verse 35. It's all the way at the end of chapter 4. Verse 35, you may have to turn your page one more time. It says this, so you got 
Jesus and his disciples, this is all brand new. They're walking around with Jesus. They're following him. Peter's already had a really personal experience with Jesus in, the, in that he healed, Jesus has healed Peter's mother-in-law, okay? But they're all like going around with Jesus. He's teaching parables. He's doing all this crazy stuff. And then you get to verse 35 of chapter four, and it says this, on the same day, when they're a full day of ministry, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, this is Jesus to his disciples, let us cross over to the other side. One sentence, just one message, one message. Maybe I could share this with you today because maybe you need to hear this. Um, maybe Jesus is telling you, hey, let us cross over to the other side. Meaning this, it's, I believe it's the most important part of this, this little story here. Jesus with confidence is telling his disciples, let's all get in the boat together and let's cruise on over to the other side. Meaning this, we're gonna depart from this port. It's a lake, they didn't really have ports, but you get it. So we're gonna go from point A to point B. We, all of us, collectively, in one boat, we're gonna launch out together and we're gonna land together. We're gonna dock together. We will make it to the other side. You see that, right? I'm not like, that's clearly what it says. Let us cross over to the other side. What he didn't tell them was that there was a storm coming. Jesus was not surprised by the storm. Jesus is not surprised by the storm that is currently raging within your life if there is one. The message is still the same. Let's get in the boat and let's go to the other side. If he has said that, it will happen. It will happen. You can bank on it. You can go all in on that. Anything that Jesus tells you, if he says, get in the boat, we're going from here to there, and I'll be with you the whole way, you can, you can cash in on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus is so confident of it that he finds a pillow and he takes a nap. If you're gonna be like anybody in this story, just be like Jesus. Who doesn't like taking naps, right? Look, I'm ADD like to the max, okay? It's hard for me to sit still, but there are some days where it's like, the nap is the best gift by God in the world, right? You're like, I just wanna, just a quick one. I just need to reset. Here's Jesus, look at it. It says, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, other little boats were also with them, so they're trailing behind them. And it says, verse 37, a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat, not against the boat, but the waves were coming into the boat so that it was already filling. Does that kind of feel like your life right now? You're like, Lord, the storm is raging and it's, the, it's, you know, the wind's bad enough, but man, the waves are coming into my boat and I'm taking on water. And your response might be just like the disciples' response. It says, but Jesus, he was at the stern, asleep on a pillow, beautiful, amazing. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher, rabbi, Do you not care? You remember what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, right? Cast all your cares on him. Why? Because he cares about you. I, 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 this is, I can't be dogmatic on this, meaning like I can't say for certain. I think it's probably Peter waking Jesus up, right? He's the most vocal guy out of the whole group. He's the one with the foot in the mouth disease, right? Like he's always talking before he's thinking. I'm sure it's Peter who's shaking Jesus saying, look, dude, you got to get up. Why don't you care about us? How can you sleep during a time like this? How are you at rest during a time like this? How are you so peaceful during a time like this? Jesus, where are you at? I'd venture to say that there's probably a lot of prayers going around right now that echo that, that sentiment. Jesus, where are you at? Jesus, why don't you care? 
and I will remind you of 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares onto him because, well, because he cares about you. Don't think he's absent. Don't think he's absent. Now, I, this can apply to a virus, but I think this goes beyond that because we, we go through storms in life all the time as, as human beings. And as Christ followers, you will go through storms, absolutely. But his silence does not mean he doesn't care. His silence does not mean that he doesn't care. You might need to just take a note from him and say, you know what, Jesus, if you're not stressed out about this, then maybe I shouldn't be stressed out about this. Easier said than done. Easier said than done. I'm not going to lie to you. Easier said than done. But it is possible, right? That's not your cop-out. Your cop-out's not like, well, it's, it's just easier said than done. That pastor, that preacher guy said it, right? So why, why even try it? No, no, that's not true. It's possible. It's possible. You just keep going to him. You just keep going to him. Keep going to him. They wake him up. They're like, Jesus, why don't you care? Do you not care that we're perishing? Do you not care that we're dying here? Jesus, where are you at? How can you be sleeping at a time like this? We're going down. We're going under. Why don't you care about us? Jesus wakes up, verse 39. He arose, probably walked right past the disciples, didn't even say anything to these guys. He'll deal with them in a second. Walks probably right up to the, the side of the boat there, and he rebukes the wind, and it stops, and he says to the sea, peace, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm, and then he turns to his disciples, right? And then that's probably when it's settling in on their hearts and their mind of like, oh man, should we have been like that panicked? Should we have... You think it was right for us to wake up Jesus? Should we have been that worried about that? Because it seems like there's nobody else like this guy. He looks at them and he says, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? What else could they have wanted? He was in the boat with them. There's going to be another storm, and he's not in the boat with them. Now he comes walking out to them, and they freak out, and they think like, oh, it's a ghost, right? Which I probably would have done too. Like some, a man is walking on the water. My mind's going to go there too, okay? I'm not, I, the, I identify with these disciples totally, okay? But he's, he's there with them. Why are you so afraid? And you may be thinking, yeah, but he was there with them. Can I share something with you? Jesus is closer to you today than he was with these disciples on that boat. If, if you can hold on to anything, if you can grasp hold of anything that I have to say to you today, it, I, I need you to get a hold of that. Jesus told his disciples, I'm going away, and it is better that I go away because the Father's going to send the, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, and he's going he's gonna to indwell inside you. He's going to live inside you. He can't get any closer to you. He can't get any closer to you. So you might be thinking like, yeah, but he was on the boat. Yeah, but he's in your heart. He's in your heart. If you're a Christ follower, if you're not, well, we can solve that today. Not I, I can't solve it for you, but you can surrender to him and say, look, Jesus, I don't want to be in the boat with you. I want you in my heart. I want you to, Holy Spirit, take a residency inside of me because I want to be that close to you. And he would turn and he would look at James and he would say, James, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? I'm not afraid of viruses. I'm not. I respect, I respect him. I don't think it's a fake thing. What gets me anxious is, is never that stuff. It never is. My health will get me anxious pretty quickly, especially as I get older and things are like, I'm like, I don't think it's not working like it used to. Like my body's falling apart and I'll get worried. I'll get anxious. I'll get all that stuff. I get anxious about my kids and their health and their safety. And that wave will come crashing down on me. 
And Jesus is so faithful. He'll pull us out of those waves and say, hey, I'm still with you. I'm still with you. I haven't left you. And he even says in his word, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. We either believe that or we don't. That's how it goes. You either believe it or you don't. And if you believe it, then, then act on it. Live it out. Embrace that truth. And you'll be a beautiful mess all the way to heaven. You'll be messing up and failing and all that stuff. But man, embrace that. Embrace the fact that he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. He knows what he got when he got you. Please understand that. When, this, when I was 19 and I finally surrendered to Jesus, he knew he wasn't getting a special deal with me. He knew the mess he was inheriting. But what's, it's the same story for me as it, as it is for you guys. He says, but watch what I can do. But watch what I can do with the mess. Course of, over the course of time and your walk with Jesus, he's working on you. He's strengthening, strengthening you, just like Peter in this story. This is just an indication of, of where Peter was at when he first was you know, on his journey with Jesus. And he's crying out. He's freaking out. He, he, they're scared they're going to die. And Jesus calls him out. He's like, why are you so afraid? Um, how is it that you don't have any faith? Where's your faith at? Where's your, where's your trust in me? Where is it at? But the wind and the waves, and they were coming in the boat. And he's like, yeah, but don't you trust me? Yeah, but Lord, you don't understand. He's like, no, I, I get it. I understand. But I'm in it with you. And if I'm not worried, maybe you shouldn't be worried. Because maybe we should go back to what he's already said. We're going to leave here, and we're going to end here, and we will all get there. And they made it to the other side. They made it to the other side. And I think this is one of those lessons in Peter's life as, again, as he's growing on this journey with Jesus. And that's what we're all on. It's a journey with Jesus. It, it, there's this, this arch, okay? And it's called sanctification. That's a nice fancy church word, right? But it just means that you're in the progress of growing and maturing as you follow Jesus. All along that journey, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to blow it. You're going to mess up. You're, guess what? You're a sinner. I don't know if you know that, and I hate to step on your toes or expose truth to you. You're a sinner, just like I'm a sinner, and we sin. He died on the cross for our sins. We want to, be, we want to sin less, but we will never be without sin until we stand in his presence in eternity. That's when you'll be perfect. So if you're aiming for perfection... Throw that in the garbage right now. You're not going to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. You will be a beautiful mess, a beautiful mess all the way through. And God loves it. And he'll, he'll help you up. You repent. If you sin, own it, repent of it, say you're sorry, confess it, then move on. Move on. And then when you do it again, go through the same thing. Own it, confess it, and then just and keep growing, keep growing. So this is what we see with Peter. He's, he's in the storm. He thinks he's going to die. And these are all just parts of, of his little story that show us that he is the perfect guy to say, listen, cast all your cares on him because he cares about you. He could speak this truth because he lived this truth. There's another story where I, I told you before that there's another storm and Jesus is walking out to them. And Peter's like, he, you can tell he gets a little bit more boldness here, right? Because he's like, Jesus, call me out there to you. Like, you're walking on the sea. Uh, I want to walk on the sea too. Call me out there. And so Jesus is like, well, come on. All 12 of them could have hopped out of the boat and walked on the water if they wanted to. But Peter was like the only one saying like, okay, I think I remember the lesson from that last one. Like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't panic. I shouldn't freak out, right? So, well, maybe I can walk on water too. And Jesus is like, yeah, bring it. Let's go. So he takes a few steps on the water. But then what happens? The wind's still blowing. Same wind. Same sea. Sea of Galilee. Really, it's a lake. Same sea. Same conditions. It's wind. It's high waves. It's chaos. It's turbulence. His circumstances. That's what it was. But he's walking out there. He's walking maybe one step, maybe two steps. We don't even know. But as soon as he takes his eyes off of Jesus, 
he goes down. He goes down. This wave, uh, which, again, that's one of the heaviest waves in the world. Um, that's sometimes what life feels like, right? You're like, oh, I think it's going to kill me. Um, yeah, that's kind of, he focused on the wave. He focused on the circumstances. Took his eyes off of Jesus, and the moment he did that, he sank. I can tell you in my life personally, when I find myself going through seasons of anxiety, maybe even depression, like depression for real? Yeah, seriously, like depression at times, where I'm like, I don't even want to get out of bed. Like, I don't, and again, I'm this spastic ADD guy, like, I can't even sit still. And everybody knows, if I'm like slow going, if I'm dragging myself out of bed, then something's not right. The moment I take my eyes off of Jesus, I go down. I go down. Here's what's so amazing about Jesus. He's still there. He's still there. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And, and he's right there to say, like, look, you're going down. And Peter, what did Peter do? He cried out to Jesus, save me. And Jesus reaches down with one arm, probably. And again, I think Jesus is probably the strongest dude ever, okay? I don't care what your Renaissance painters, he's, number one, he's not white, all right? He doesn't have, I'm sure he doesn't have blonde or blue eyes, okay? Probably not blonde hair either. Um, he's Middle Eastern. And he's a carpenter. He grew up in a, you know, doing carpentry stuff with Joseph. This dude probably picks Peter up with one arm and throws him back into the boat, right? He's like, dude, don't worry about it. No worries. Boom, it just throws him back in the boat. There's times in my life where I need Jesus to do that for me. You and I need, we need number one, we got to get in a really good habit of just crying out to Jesus. Do you, if you feel yourself sinking, make it your habit to cry out to him first. First, Jesus save me. But I'm already saved. I'm not talking about salvation like that. I'm talking about save me in the midst of my storm. Stay, save me in the midst of these circumstances that I have no control over. I've taken my eyes off of you. I need you to rescue me. And he knows how to rescue us. At what point in time did he snatch Peter out of the water? I don't know. Maybe he let him go down a little bit. I have no idea. Maybe it was a good lesson for Peter, right? But he rescued him. He snatched him out of the water. He's in the business of rescuing people. It's what he does. Another story that highlights this point for us is found in the book of Acts, teaching through the book of Acts for our, with our church down there in Galveston. And early on, when the church gets started, Peter gets arrested. He gets arrested for preaching the gospel, okay? Which, you know, 10 years ago, what it seemed like, well, that's kind of weird, right? Not, not in America. Well, now it's like, well, that could probably happen any day now, um, for sure. But Peter gets locked up, and he's, he's in prison, and they have every intent to kill him. That's their goal, locking Peter up in prison. They, they're going to murder this guy. Why? Because if they kill him, then they kill the church. He's one of the leaders. Strike the shepherd. They identified Peter as one of the top guys, and they, they arrest him, and their full intent that next day was to murder Peter. And I can tell you this, he probably knew that. So you're locked up in jail. You've done nothing wrong. You're sitting there in, the, in a dungeon, and you know, like, man, the sun comes up. That's probably it for me. The beauty of that story is this. The same Peter from Mark chapter 4 who was crying out, Jesus, why don't you care? We're dying. In that jail cell, you don't hear anything. He's praying. You know he's praying. You know he's probably singing some songs. You know he's at perfect peace. Why? because he's learned this principle. I'll just give Jesus all my cares. I'll just give him all my, all my anxieties. I'll give him all my fears. He'll take them. And you can sleep in a dungeon cell the night before you, it's probably gonna be your last night on this earth at perfect peace. He was busted out of jail. He got released out of jail, but why? Because it wasn't his time. 
It wasn't his time. And, and that's the other thing we need to realize as well is like humanity does not determine when your time is up. Only God does. He's got to say in that. He knows your days. Before you were even thought of, before you even existed, he already knew you. And he knew you were going to be born on this day to that family. And you will live your life like this, doing all this stuff. And on this day in history, you'll either be raptured up with him. Please let that happen any day now, please. Or you'll take your final breath and you will be in an instant in his presence. If he's your savior. Doesn't apply to everybody. He, he knows. Peter didn't have to worry about those guys taking his life. And even if they were going to, then they were going to. But he didn't have to be concerned about that. He didn't have to fear that. He didn't have to fear that because God's in control, right? The other church word for that is sovereign. He's in control. Well, it doesn't feel like he's in control. Well, it doesn't matter what you feel. I'm sorry, but your feelings don't always dictate truth, all right? They don't always convey truth. My feelings, man, I can't trust in these things at times. I can't rely on my feelings all the time. I gotta rely on what, what has been said. Are we gonna make it to the other side? Jesus said yes. Jesus said yes. So Peter made it out of jail, he gets reunited, and then then God uses Peter to open up the door of the, of the gospel to Gentiles, which I think probably applies to most of us in this room today. I don't know your ethnicity or your, I don't know where you're coming from or anything like that, but most of us probably in here are, are, Jew, are of Gentiles. And look at God used Peter to bust open that door. That's awesome. Why? Because he wasn't done with him. And then he uses him to write these two letters. And within these two letters, he, God records, has Peter write down this one verse that says, listen, in this life, you will have difficulty. In this life, this Christian life, if anybody has ever told you differently, I'm sorry to tell you, but they lied to you. If any pastor has ever told you differently that following Jesus would be smooth selling, they lied to you. And they ought to repent of that. Because to follow Jesus means to share not only in his free gifts of salvation, I just taught on this last week to our church down there, but it also means to share in his suffering. And you should consider it all joy. It's a privilege. Us Westerners, us Americans, we really like the idea of like smooth sailing, no troubles. Cast your cares onto him. Well, obviously that means I give him what I'm, these things that are troubling me, these cares, these anxieties, and then he takes them and I never have to deal with them again. No, you don't know how to read your Bible. I'm sorry, but that's, that's like the American way to read a Bible. That's not how it works. The technical term here in casting your cares onto the Lord has this idea of rolling your fear, rolling your worry, rolling your anxiety like it's a giant ball onto Jesus with the understanding that just because it rolls that way doesn't mean it won't roll back. Well, why would God let it roll back into my life? Because you need him to. Well, no, no, I want, I want like the one and done. I want to just like, cast this care onto him, and I never have to worry about that again. Let me, let me expose something to you guys. If this was a one and done, okay, how many of us would ever go back to him? How many of us would ever go back to him? Not many of us. How often would I run back to Jesus if I've given him all my cares and I casted all that stuff onto him and I never have to worry about trouble or hardship or trials or tribulations ever again in my life, how often do I go back to him? The reason why he may allow it to roll back into your life is so that you keep coming back to him. And here's the, here's the bonus, right? Because you still could be thinking like, well, that just doesn't sound loving. 
Well, no, see, think of it in a way of Jesus is your personal trainer. You got that heavy weight, you want to roll it onto him? Well, you're getting some exercise. And it comes back to you, okay, roll it back to him. Oh, it comes back, okay, keep rolling it back to him. But what's going to happen? You're going to get stronger. You're going to get stronger. You're going to grow. And that burden, those worries, they will probably always be there, but they may not be so massive. They might actually get a little bit easier to roll over to where it's like this giant boulder, Indiana Jones style, right? Like it's going to squash me to where now it's like a little kickball. And you're like, hey, Jesus, there you go. Jesus, uh, oh man, this thing's creeping back in my life. Here you go. I'm just going to boot it over to Jesus. There you go, Jesus. Time. It's just, it's time. It's following Jesus. It's committing yourself to him forever and just walking with him and growing and developing and allowing him to stretch you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You either believe it or you don't. Cast all your cares onto me because I care for you. You either believe it or you don't. And I would say this, you can absolutely trust in him. You can cast your cares onto him. You can heave those things. And even the idea of it behind that is, is using both your hands to chunk whatever that is, that fear, that worry, that anxiety, to chunk that over to Jesus and say, here, you can have it. Take it. And I would make it probably a practice of your life to periodically, maybe daily, to say, Jesus, will you take all my, all my worries, all my cares, all my fears, all, the, all my anxieties, would you please just take those today? If it's something that you've wrestled with for any time, you, you kind of know you should be able to spot indicators within your life of when that's creeping back in, when the wave, so to speak, is, is bu- starting to build up on you. And you'd be smart, you'd be wise to surrender to him immediately. Like, Lord, I feel it coming. I got that sensation in me, Lord, and I feel that anxiety. It's just, man, it's creeping up, Lord. Man, will you just take it? Will you please just take it from me? That's, that's one of the main things we have to get as believers in, in this walk with Jesus is the fact that he actually does care about you. He actually does. He does. He cares about you. And not just like, well, like you as in like this big general you, like all of us kind of a deal. Yes, but more specifically, you as the individual. And what you're going through personally in your life right now, the Lord is aware of it and he actually cares about it. You're like, oh, it doesn't feel like he cares about it. I'm going to just say this. You have to trust him. Don't give up on him. Please, never give up. It is always too soon to quit on him. It is always too soon to quit on Jesus. He has never given up on you. He has never stopped loving you. He has never stopped caring about you. He is, he's never stopped. His love is perfect for you. And he watches you as you go. He's there with you as you go through these storms. And when it feels like he's not there, maybe he's just chilling out at the stern of the boat on a pillow saying like, I'm not worried about it. There's a lot of lessons we can learn from that for sure. But that's why I think Peter was the perfect guy for this. I think he, I think he just nailed it, man. Like he's lived this life. He's walked through all this. And as he's getting to the end of, you know, end of his life, he's like, Man, if I can tell you guys how to do church, how to live corporately as a body, if I can leave you with one message. Now, the rest of the chapter goes on to remind us of the fact that there is an enemy, and it is Satan, and he's a real thing, okay? And he is prowling around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. That's an absolute reality for all Christians. But should we be concerned about that? Should we be, you know, should I be fearful of that? No, because we go back to verse 7, and we're not afraid of that. Why? Because, because God cares about us. And if we can grasp one thing, if we can hold on to one thing, if we could memorize maybe one scripture for today, it's not even a hard one to memorize. My goodness, like it's, it's not even a full sentence, right? If you just look at verse seven, you're like casting all your care upon him because he cares about you. We need to get this. In the day and age in which we live, the church needs to get this. 
Because when we can cast, when we can get into the habit or the practice of giving him all that troubles us, all that worries us, all that makes us afraid, if we can get into the habit of doing that, it will inject confidence into us. The church needs to be confident in these days. Are these the last days? Sure. Sure. I believe we are on the, we're on the doorstep, basically, of eternity. Is Jesus coming back? Oh, totally, absolutely. When? I hope soon. <laughs> I'm hoping it's soon. I believe it is really soon. I think what we're seeing is a good precursor, a good heads up of what's about to happen, what's going to come. So it's now, church, that we should live confidently, not in our ability, but in him, in his ability, and what he's already done. Just to remind you, if you've given your life to Jesus, he has commanded you to do certain things. Love the Lord your God with all aspects of who you are, mind, body, soul, all that good stuff. Love your neighbor as yourself. We should be doing that. My goodness, if a church can't do that, then what in the world are we doing? Who's my neighbor, <laughs> right? Uh, well, yeah, everyone. Look around you. Neighbors, 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 neighbors. Your physical neighbors that live next door to you, whoever they may be, whether or not they agree with you, right? Doesn't matter. You love them. Love God, love others. There's something else we're supposed to do. He has commissioned every single one of his believers. He's commissioned you, meaning he has given you a command to fulfill, and that's to go and preach his gospel. That's to go and share his gospel. That's to go and make disciples, baptizing him in his name. You, the church has been commanded to do this. Yeah, but I don't think the Lord really understood what was going to happen in 2020. That was going to make that so difficult. I don't think we know the Lord if we're, that's our answer. He's fully aware of that. Is it a little bit more challenging? Sure. Should we expect that? Absolutely. But does that mean we get a free pass? No, not at all. You share the gospel. There's a bigger threat out there than COVID-19. There's a bigger threat. There's a bigger threat than socialism, communism. There's a bigger threat than riots. It's called sin. Let us never lose sight of that. Let us never lose focus, Christians. The biggest issue our world is facing right now is sin, is sin. And we have the cure. His name is Jesus. And how dare we hide away because we're afraid when we ought to be sharing the gospel. But I, I, but I figure it out. I don't know. I can't talk to people. I got to wear this stupid mask, and nobody knows what I'm saying, and I don't even know what they're saying because it's all muffled. I have no idea. No, no, figure it out. Figure it out. Let's figure it out. As, as a church, as a body, let's figure out how we can get the gospel out there because people are they're dying, and they have no hope. And yet here we are with the greatest hope, hope personified, and that's Jesus. So brothers and sisters, we have to remember we are on a mission. We are on a mission. This, this is not our home. I love America. It's great. It's, it's a flawed nation for sure. It's great. But this is not my home. I'm a citizen of heaven first before I am a citizen of the United States of America. My allegiance is to heaven. But when, my, when that's right, I'll be a good citizen in the country in which I live. I don't care where I live. I can be a good, I can be a good citizen anywhere. Why? Because my citizenship is secured in heaven. And that's my focus. You and I need to remember that we're on a mission for Jesus. And there are a lot of people that are burdened down right now. There are a lot of people that are carrying these huge weights of anxiety and fear 
and, and all this stuff. They're just overwhelmed by it. And yet we have the answer to, to their problem. We have the solution, and his name is Jesus. You and I, we got to, we can't lose sight of that. Please, never lose sight of that. <clears throat> I'm sorry to tell you that your um, Facebook posts and stuff are probably not gonna save anybody's soul. Your disagreements with this or that, it's probably not gonna save anybody. It's not gonna introduce anybody to Jesus. What's gonna, what's gonna save them? Jesus. What's gonna introduce them to Jesus? The gospel. Christians, don't get distracted. Stay focused. Focused on him. Share the gospel. Love people. Love people. Love them. Whether they're a donkey or an elephant, Democrat, Republican. I did that at first service, and they're like, what? I'm like, come on. Like, nobody gets that? Um, it doesn't matter what, what, what side of the aisle they stand on. It does not matter. It doesn't matter. Well, they, the world wants you to think it matters. It doesn't. It doesn't. We're here to communicate the gospel of Jesus. We're here to set people free. He can use us to set people free to, so that they don't have to carry, they don't have to carry around this, this fear, this anxiety anymore. They can be set free because of Jesus. That's what we have. We can't lose sight of that. So let's stay focused. The best way you can stay focused is by you casting all your cares onto him, by you giving him all your anxieties, by you being free and living that out and walking that out. And are you going to struggle? Yes. Are you going to go from today like, sweet, I'm going to live in freedom. No more fear, no more worry. And you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're going to get hit by the giant, the biggest wave you've ever experienced. Could happen. It could happen. But what do you do? You just give it back to him. Say, Lord, I don't want this. <laughs> I can't handle this. It's too big for me. Please take it. Help me to get in the practice, Lord, of being humble, knowing that I'm not strong enough and that, Lord, you are more than strong enough. So we're going to wrap this up with communion. Here is a perfect picture of how Jesus cares about you. Communion couldn't have happened on a better day. This whole verse, cast all your cares onto him because he cares about you, like, well, does he really? Yes, he does. It's it, this, this wafer, cracker, whatever this thing is, it's edible, I think. Um, this little thing in this package, it represents his body. I and mean, I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians, but here's what I'm going to say. Even as you guys are figuring out the puzzle of getting those things out of there, um, I'm going to ask that you guys hold on to those because we're going to do communion just a little bit different. At least as far as maybe what you're used to experiencing. Paul, Paul said this to the church of Corinth concerning communion, what we do. He says, For I received from the Lord that which was also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. Okay, that's, that's what's represented here. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which has been, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Okay, so the whole, the whole aspect of communion is celebrating Jesus, but it's, it's remembering what he did for you. He went to the cross for you. He endured all these things for, for you and I, so that you could walk through life and, and not be imprisoned by your fears. It's locked in that prison cell of, of anxiety. Man, Jesus walked through that dungeon and he kicked the locks off of every single one of those doors. So know this, anytime I'm going through anxiety, it's because I've walked myself back into that little prison and I'm holding the door shut. And Jesus is saying, listen, I've already kicked the lock off of that thing. Why don't you just come on out? Why don't you just make the choice to come on out? I've already set you free. So come on out. That's represented through the sacrifice of him dying on the cross. His body was broken. He says, in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Remembrance of me, it, it's just telling you to stay focused on Jesus. 
Do communion as often as you want to. You don't have to wait till the first Sunday of every month. Break out some saltines at your house and some grape juice and celebrate Jesus and what he has done for you as often as you want. You don't need me. You don't need Pastor Bill. You don't need anybody else. You can do that on your own. What's the point of it? Remembering him. It says, it's a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it and remember to me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. What's the beauty of his death? The fact that he rose again three days later. The beauty of his death is the fact that he took all of your sins upon himself. He drank from the cup of wrath so that you wouldn't have to drink from it. That's what's so beauty about his death, beautiful about his death. So we're going to celebrate that, but here's how we're going to celebrate this. I'm going to pray. <clears throat> Worship team will get up here. They'll close out with a song. All I ask is this. When you're ready to take this, then you take it. You take it. Well, you're supposed to like pray and three, two, one, we eat a cracker and drink the juice, right? Like, no, we're not doing that today. I believe, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. When we take it together, man, that's such a beautiful thing. When you eat the, the cracker together and you drink the juice together, it's a beautiful thing for sure. But there are times, there are times where I just need to take my time. And so that's what I'm going to encourage you to do today. Take this, prepare it however you want. As they finish out with this last song, that's your cue to be, you pray. You thank him for his body. You thank him for his blood. I'll, I'll pray and I'll do all that too, but you don't need me to do that. You do that. If you're with a spouse, do that together. Because communion is an intimate thing. It's a beautiful thing. And it's meant to be experienced between you and the Lord. So we'll give you this last song. When you're ready, you take it, OK? And then you'll be nice. And you'll take your cup, your cup and you'll throw it in the trash can, OK? You're not going to leave it behind, right? So do the cleanup crew a favor, all right? But you enjoy Jesus. You celebrate him. And you thank him that he actually cares about you. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. Lord, may we never forget that, well, this is the day that you've made. And we should rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, I pray, and I know, Lord, it, it's, it's difficult right now, Lord, if we're honest. It, it is a little scary, I guess, Lord, depending on who you listen to. I, I pray that our eyes wouldn't be fixed on our circumstances. I, I pray that we wouldn't get distracted by, I pray we'd be aware, but not distracted. Lord, that we'd be knowledgeable, uh, but Lord, not, our eyes wouldn't be taken off of you. Help us to stay focused on you, Jesus. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much that you came to this earth and, and you lived a sinless life, Lord, and, and you died on the cross for our sins so that we could be with you forever. Lord, we thank you so much for that. And I thank you that, Lord, it, that free gift of salvation is still on the table today. I pray for anybody in this room, Lord, who, who just needs to surrender to you today, Lord, that they would do that, Lord, that they would just, man, that they would take that free gift. And in case that is you, I, I need you to understand, it's as simple as you just crying out to him saying, Lord Jesus, save me. I'll take that free gift of salvation. I want you to live in me, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you are with us. Lord, that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. And Lord, as, as imperfect as we are, you never give up on us. As faithless as we are, you are faithful. And Lord, I pray that all of us, Lord, are as we're keeping our eyes fixed on you, that we are purpose within our hearts to grow in our relationship with you, Jesus. I pray that it, Lord, knowing that the anxiety, knowing that the fear, knowing that those things will probably never fully go away, Lord, but I pray that we would get stronger the more times we roll those things onto you. So help us, Lord help us. Jesus, you're so good. You're amazing. And man, we love you so much. 
I thank you for everybody here today. I pray blessings on them and what, what you have in store for them this week. I pray for anybody wrestling with anxiety or fear right now. Lord Jesus, I pray that you as, Lord, in, in your peace that surpasses all understanding would fill their hearts and their minds. And Lord, that we wouldn't be anxious over anything, but Lord, that we'd be praying and we'd be going to you nonstop. You never get annoyed with us. You welcome our prayers. So we thank you, Lord. I thank you for everybody here today. I thank you for Grace Church. Lord, I pray that Grace Church continues to, to grow. Lord, because your word's being taught here, the gospel's going out, lives are being changed and transformed, and your, this body is growing, and I pray that they're growing together, closer together and closer to you, Lord, watching each other's backs and looking to turn Amarillo upside down for the kingdom of God. So blessings on Grace Church, Pastor Bill, the staff here, and just this body, Lord, is what I would pray. I'm just so, so grateful for this family. And Lord, we, we, just, we just give you all these things, Lord. Take, take all of it, Lord. Take all of it, the good and the bad, Lord. We, we give it to you. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.